are your um, what are your early memories of Moors and the and the Kipper business really? Um, the first memory of coming down to Moors Kipper Yard with me, with me dad when I was about five. Uh, we were coming down to get herring and kippers for his uncle Jack, who had the fish shop in Ramsey. I remember coming in here, it was a busy place. I remember seeing Percy Moore, and he was a big tall fella with a, an old trilby hat on. And for some reason, he terrified me. He must have been shouting at the girls to do the work or something like that, and I always remember that. So that's probably 58 years ago. So that was my first memory of Moore's Kipper Yard. I started coming down here, uh, driving when I was 16, so that was a sort of mid 70s and um, the heaven season was from June to September so I was still at school at the time so in my school holidays I'd come down here half six in the morning come and see the girls and say I wanted 20 stone of kippers then I'd go down the fishing boats and I'd buy a couple of boxes of heaven for cash in the old days when we could use cash and um, come back up here and the girls had put, picked the best 20 stone of kippers they had for me Again, that was fantastic because the same women were there for donkey's years. Uh, great rapport, you know, give you a cuddle and a kiss and how you doing, Paul? You know, it was that real friendly, fantastic spot. So I loved, I loved Moors Kippy Yard. I was brought up with it. Um, never thought I'd ever own it. Never ever thought I'd ever own it. But it was a great place, you know. The same people really worked here for probably 30 years, really, because they came over here, a lot of them. Uh, from Scotland and different places. They followed the herring around the Irish Sea, came here to work. And because the season was quite long, they met, met a man or a woman, settled in, and got married and stayed here. And Moors didn't have a, a massive turnover staff. They always stayed. It was always known as like a really friendly yard. The best quality kippers you'd get in the old man. The Manx people thought, said Moors, because obviously, this yard was built in the 1880s, 1882, specifically for Kipping, no other reason. It's in the A1 position, um, prevailing winds southwesterly, so it's, it's built here for the southwesterly wind. You're in a valley, so you get a nice airflow in to keep your fires going. The building never gets a sun, so in the 1880s before refrigeration, obviously, if it was 70 degrees or 75 degrees in the summer outside, it was 55, 60 inside, which is, which is a big thing, you know. And, and, and that was very clever people who designed this yard. Also, there wasn't running water in those days, so um, river next door, but we've actually got a well in here. So they used the well, the water from the well. Amazing. They dug down as well. And, and we had it tested about oh, 20, 25 years ago, and it was still drinkable. Don't know how, but it was still drinkable. Also, the um, fire brigade came one night and tried to pump it out for a bit of an exercise. and couldn't pump it out. It was just it must have come up under pressure. So I think maybe um, that it could be used again because water's getting more expensive. Um, you might probably have to put a purification unit in or something, but it, it's amazing. It's all here. You know, it's, it's a great place. It's extraordinary. And what, so how did it work then? Obviously, the, 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 they were only open three or four months of the year, so that's it just yeah. it's very seasonal. Yeah. They always wanted kippers for TT week. They always wanted kippers for TT week. Now the first heron that came in were very small. Um, they're hard to find really because first of all, they used to pay maybe a couple of boats to go out early to have a look around because the heron moved around. And they didn't have the technology originally to find the heron. So they had to use all log books. Um, you know, the fish would write down every day where they'd been fishing, what they caught. So the old boys would pass them on to the sons or family and they'd look back and say well on the 1st of June or 2nd of June we found herring in Laxey or wherever it was they'd go back to the same places and nine times out of ten they could find them so these boys would be paid maybe for a week or two to go out to have a look around they might not catch anything but they'd still give them a pay their expenses and give them a wage once they found the herring then they'd start fishing so that, that would be sort of beginning of June really that was normally TT week um, through the season, obviously, the herring would get bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, the best time to get herring was probably end of July, uh, beginning of August, because they were quite big. They had a fat back and a thin belly. As you went on further in the season, they started sort of breeding off the Douglas Bank, end of August, beginning of September. That's when you see the old photos of um, salt and herring down, because they shoaled. They were dead easy to catch because of massive shoals, huge shoals. Also, they'd have spotters up on the hills looking for the herring. 
But what we did see is, because the herring were full of oil, so you'd have your waves and then you'd see like flat, because the oil had flattened it. So the spotters would see the herring and then they'd get in touch with the people and tell them where the herring were. So that was, that was good as well. Amazing. And obviously there was, so the North Sea shut up shop in, in the 70s, didn't it? So everyone came here. So tell me yeah. about the 70s, what the madness of the... It was mad. I think, I'm not too sure about the dates, probably late 70s, maybe early 80s. The North Sea shut for two or three years. So there's no herring, they couldn't buy herring. So all the buyers came from the North Sea to the Isle of Man. Of course, the Manx buyers didn't like that. They didn't want them on their patch. So um, roughly, herring used to be 20 pound a unit, which is a couple of hundred weight boxes, roughly 20 pound. Those years, they were up to 60. I think even one day they reached 100 pound a unit, but they were between 60 and 70 pound a unit. Well, the fishermen were absolutely made up because they were making a lot of money, a fortune, right? And it was a Klondike for them. But obviously the Kippercures couldn't really make the money because the hemmings were too dear. So they were struggling. I think they even got helped out a bit by the government from what I can gather. I'm not too sure about that, but I think somebody told me that. But it could be just Manx tales, like, you know. Um, North Sea opened. Obviously all the hemming buyers went back to the North Sea. So the local people here who'd made very little money, if any money, they didn't want to pay £60 a unit. The heron went down to not even 20, they were between about 10, 15, 18, that amount of money. Um, the Manx boats just struggled to catch a bulk because most of them were just single boat, 40, 40 foot, towing a net. They couldn't catch a bulk. The pair trawlers, were the, um, most of them were Irish, they had bigger engines, bigger nets, they could get the bulk. You know. Also, they found um, Queenies, a mar uh, market for Queenies in America for the white meat. So what happened was the Manx boats could earn more money fishing queenies than they could fish and herring. So they stopped fishing herring, and then, because if you stop fishing herring for a period of time, the quote was taken off you. So then they sold the quotas to the Irish boats. So over a period of time, most of the Manx boats stopped fishing. Then the Irish ones took over the quotas, bought them out, and carried on fishing. We were, we were the last people here. Well, I was the last person here that had Manx herring landed from Norman Sands. We sort of, um, we had a word with Norman, and Norman at the time was probably, I don't know, I think Norman was 70 at the time. He'd been fishing heron for 55, 60 years, literally since he was a boy. He went out, he knew all the places to go to, but he struggled to find any big herring. Um, in fact, it took him about nearly two weeks to find any herring at all. Uh, when he found them, they were quite small. We managed to smoke some, and the rest went for crab and lobster bait. But after two or three landings, we had a discussion and Norman wasn't happy because catching small herring was causing a lot of work here. And we just decided that really it wasn't economical to, to carry on fishing. So he was the last person. And he was actually fishing off an Irish quota. He was in the Irish PO and he actually, the, the quota he had was from that, from the Irish, not the Manx one, it was Irish. So then, obviously, you needed a... Well, a, a reliable source of, of, of herring to carry on, so obviously you started buying it from the North, North Sea. Yeah, well, again, what happened was the Irish boats, maybe, I don't know, there could be 20 pairs of boats fishing. They found langoustines off here, so they fished langoustines, so they could make more money fishing langoustines than herring. So they sold their quotas to the bigger boats. So now I think there's two pairs of boats, huge boats, that own the whole the Irish Sea quota. And they can land two, three hundred tonne of one net or more maybe so that's that's what happened with that really um so and these boats were massive they couldn't hardly, they couldn't get in the peel the two-thirds of size of peel uh, breakwater and also the tank boats so what they do is when they catch them in the nets they pump them in into the tanks and they could have 200 ton well they weren't geared up in the Isle of Man for 200 ton a day or whatever it was in the summer didn't have the staff it was just too much bulk um, and then they'd land them in Ireland and then they'd pump them put them out of the boats they just put them in tankers like um, milk tankers and then tanker them up to, up to the factory and laterally they put pipes in underground pipes so the pipes just pump the herring in straight into the factory so it's very commercialised now we have to buy a herring now we buy them from uh, Scotland Fraserburgh so the, all the herring I think landed brought in I would say mostly um, some are from my, um, Holland, but we always get ours from Scotland for the last 20, 28 years, same buyer. 
you've got to buy um, try to we try to replicate the Manx herring, Manx kipper. So you want to buy a herring with got good oil content in it, Amiga oil, which is good for you. Similar sort of size, and you have to try and get the best quality you can. Each year it's getting more difficult to get you what for, to get what you want really because there's less boats fishing herring. Uh, the bigger boats, expenses gone through the roof, so they don't want to go fishing. When we when we want the herring, it's probably a month before they want to go fishing because they want to go out there and catch a lot in bulk because their expenses could be like fifty thousand pound a day literally. So they can go and get their quota in two weeks instead of two months. They've saved a lot of money, and then they'll go to up to um, Shetland. And they normally birth the boats up there because it's cheaper to birth them there. Wait for the mackerel season up in the North Sea and then maybe land mackerel up to Norway. So it's, it's, it's a massive industry now. I mean, you're talking you know, six million quid for boat. Wow. wow. So, so, so what's the... Um, I don't know, talk, talk me through the, uh, the steps of um, sort of producing, uh, you know, from... from the soaking them in the brine to, to yeah. the, the whole process of producing your, well, your kippers? Yeah, well, what you do basically is get them, split them on the machines, then we put them into brine for uh, 10 minutes. Um, you don't want them too salty. Obviously, brining is a very important part of it because if you leave them in too long, they're too salty. If you leave them in not enough time, then they won't take the smoke because it's the salt and the heat from the fires give them the colour. So that's a very important part of it. Then we tend them, tend them on the sticks, then we fill up the smokehouse. Then once they're all in the smokehouse, then we start smoking them. Um, one of the smokehouses probably holds about 15 to 20,000 herring. So in the heyday, they could have six or eight of them going. You're probably talking the 1880s, early 1900s. And I've been talking to old people, I'm talking years and years ago, and they said that there'd be 100 people working in the shard. You know, 100. In the 70s, maybe, I can only remember, I think about 15 or 20 here. But um, over the years, I've met so many people that worked in the shard. Not like one or two, you know, 100, 100 at least 100, maybe 200. And a lot of local people working here at 12 years of age. Extremely. You know, and they were, they were earning more money than the dad was. The dad maybe had a nine to five job. But in the summertime here, they were earning a lot more money because they were the hourly rate wouldn't be brilliant, but they could be doing 80 hours a week at 14. You know, they'd finish at maybe 10 o'clock at night and they're back in at 4 or 5 in the morning. You know, in those days, with no health and, health and safety didn't exist. You know, people just worked, you know, this is what they want. They needed money. Peel was a fishing village. People were quite poor in those days. Um, some of the houses would take the people in who'd come from Scotland and Ireland, they'd rent the rooms out. One person was telling me they had, uh, when they were a kid, they had six people living in one room, all the girls. And you've got to remember, there was no showers in those days, and bath once a week, or they'd go in for a swim, and they'd have uh, leather aprons come in, covered in with bloody scales. She said, and the smell was horrendous, she said, horrendous. But they did that. And then one would cook them a meal, maybe, try sell them a meal. Uh, the men would be either on the boats, um, working in the, in the factories, and the family, you know, relied on that money in the summertime. And then the winter time, they probably could do the winter winter schemes on the highway board, or they do a bit of log, make logging, get some logs, sell logs, They're just general labouring jobs, try and keep them going in the, in the winter. But the summer is when they try to get enough money in to keep them ticking over in the winter time. So it was, I think it was quite a hard life, but uh, very enjoyable. I mean, I read an article in the 1600s. They reckon there was over 600 boats fished here. And the population of Peel increased by 4,000. I don't know what the population is now, actually six or seven, but increased by 4,000. And there's quite a lot of um, murders, stabbings, you know, because the fishermen had, you know, there were six, seven, eight but people on these little boats. And the hardy men then in those days, you know, in the 1880s, early 1900s, and the uh, you know people who come from different places in Scotland, the little villages, they'd, they'd be have massive rivalry, you know, and you'd be in the pub, you'd get tanked up, and the next thing there'd be a bit of fisty cuffs, and instead there was murders and peel and and knife things and stuff like that, which is a bit harsh, but that's that's what they reckon, you know. Wow. Wow. 
it's a hard life. Crikey. And obviously people could be, you know, following them, following them. You know, if they get a good catch one day, next day you've got 50 boats following you. You know, and that would, they'd be pretty annoyed about that. Right. So like that. Talk me through the, the technicalities of, um, obviously once you've done the, uh, they've been in the brine, what, what do you do after yeah. that basically? We hang them on the sticks and then we put them up into the smoke houses. Um, they're roughly 40 foot high, the smoke houses. Obviously, the more, you, the more you put in, the higher you've got to go up. And you have to climb up like a crab. So you have to literally put your well, legs apart, arms apart. You climb up. So when you pass it to the stick, and then they, you, you put them in. Now, again, if they're not tended correctly, when you pass them up to you, they can fall off. So obviously, the women have to tend them correctly. Um, we don't do massive quantities now like they used to. Used to. So we're probably going about 15, 20 feet up. But you've still got to climb up. Um, but uh, that's, that's what really makes our product unique in the Isle of Man now because it's the time, the craft, the energy you put into doing it. And there's no shortcuts. There's a right way and there's a right way. You can't change it. If you want to go home early, you can't because it depends on the direction of the wind. Humidity, temperature, you know, lots of things. So you, if you want to go home, the only way you can do them quicker is by giving them heat, because heat smokes them quicker. The more heat you give them, the more likelihood you are of ruining the product. So when you've done all the, the work pre-smoking, to ruin it by not smoking them correct, it's a sin, so you've got to take your time. It's all about taking your time. So what we would do is we'd put six fires in there, six mounds, uh, three on the right, three on the left, and a gap of about a couple of feet in the middle. On the back two thirds of each fire, we put oak and sawdust, which would be dampened off. So when we light the fires, when the flame comes along, hits the smoke, it hits the uh, oak and stuff, that's when you get the flavour, because you want heat in there as well. So the white, white gives you the heat, the oak and sawdust gives you the flavour. And um, the gap in the middle is where I walk, because every half an hour you've got to go in, and reset the fires. So obviously, you don't want to be walking over fires because it's a good way to get burned, and you've got to just watch them. It's, 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 it's watching them, really. Now, in the old days, when they're doing bulk, the women would come in here um, in the early morning. The herring auction was eight. Herring would get up by, by nine. They'd split them, tend them. They'd fill up all the smokehouses. Now they could be buying the herring off three or four different boats, you know, and the different qualities, some could be bigger, bigger, maybe a bit softer, depending who you bought them from. So the two smokers came in the afternoon, uh, Percy Moore or Jimmy Coulson would say to them, like, oh, it was Jimmy Coulson when I was here, because Jimmy was a hell of a nice man, and Jimmy was a great man. I, I thought a lot of Jimmy. Um, he'd say, look, you know, watch these ones here, because these are a bit softer, they're not, not quite as good as these, so don't give them so much heat. You know, he'd tell them, Boys would smoke all night. Um, the women would then come in at maybe four or five, or depending on how many kippers they had in that day. They'd pack them all away. By the time they packed them all away, it was nine o'clock again, not a lot in. So that was Monday to Friday. Um, Friday, they probably wouldn't buy a lot of herring, a bit less than a, on a Thursday, because um, it was a half day on a, on a Saturday, and they'd, they'd do a bit of cleaning and what have you. They didn't never work on a Sunday. Originally, because people were religious, and some people are very religious still, but in the fishing then, you wouldn't go to work on a Sunday. They'd go to church, you know, so that was a big day for them. One day off a week, or maybe a day and a half, depending. They'd just clean up, um, get everything sorted out for the, for the Monday, and start the Monday. So obviously the big skill for you is, uh, is getting the balance between uh, cure, well, yeah. curing them and uh, not cooking them. Yeah, but once you start smoking them, after about three or four hours, I'd go and check them. Because the herring that lowers down and the nearest the fires, obviously they're getting the bulk of the heat. So if, if they're done, we, we start taking them out. But if they're not done, we know that nothing's done. So I just go in there, have a little look around, and it's all done by, well, the fires are still going. You know, we let the fires go down maybe um, 75% to keep the heat in there, can you the heat. Shut the doors down downstairs, go up, still loads of smoke in there. Put my fours down so I can walk in. I go in um, and have a quick look round. And I can tell by feel as well. If you get a, like, a drop of oil on the tail of the kipper or the, or the fillet, it's a good indication it's done. So just by touching them, also you can tell by the texture. Obviously if it's wet, 
still it's not done enough it was a bit um, drier and there's a bit of oil on the tail and I'd just whip them out have a quick look get them out in the, into the into the uh, light so I could see them and then um, start from there nothing's done uniformly you know it's impossible what you're trying to do is, is get the most consistent product you can but when you when you're using the fires it's not the way we do it it's quite difficult to do it because when we go in we might have to climb up uh, take some from the top and move them down to the bottom because the bottom row could be done that could be maybe 10 sticks or 20 sticks each side the next row maybe it's not quite done right but it could be maybe half a dozen sticks that we give them another set of fires they're going to be too smoked so i'd take them out and move them further away to the other side because obviously this the heat goes in, hits the back wall. So by the back wall, that's the hottest spot. If you go to the other side, the wall the further end, that's the coolest spot. So you'd move those six or ten sticks up near the back, climb up, pick the ones that are higher up because they wouldn't be getting so much smoke, move them at the bottom, put another set of fires in, then you might get them done, then you'd probably get the next layer done, and the half a dozen or so you'd move to the end, you get them done. Then you climb up again and move them down. You, the first lot you get out, you might only get a dozen sticks out. Then you could get 50 sticks out. Then you get 150 sticks out. And you get 300 sticks out. And the more you had in, the more you'd get out. Fair labour intensive. Gosh, wow. You know, that, how long how long have you, you worked here, really? Uh, it's funny, me and the wife were talking about it the other night. We couldn't remember, actually. <laughs> Time goes so quick. But I found a bill for one of the hair and splitting machines I bought from Hull. And that was 1997. So that must be 25 years ago. So I've, I've, about 25 years, I would say. But obviously, I've been coming down here and I've been involved in the fishing trade. Started helping me dad out in the fish shop at, say, seven or eight, 63 now. So you do the maths. It's, it's 50, over 50 years, 55 years I've been involved in the fishing industry, really. Um, I've loved it. I have. I've, got, I've met some fantastic people. Um, people come in this yard. They're so interested in the heritage and and over the years in TT week, Grand Prix week, the same people will be coming back for 25 years and a lot of them are friends now. They're actually not just customers, they come in and they'll make a cup of tea themselves or give us a hand or they've seen my little son grow up from five, six years old down here now. He's a 28-year-old chartered accountant. They've seen him grow up over a period of time. They're always asking for him and they're always interested in him. When he was studying in Wales, um, for the exams, there's a couple that used to come here in the kippy yard, and they even said they'd put them up, give them his food, all free, put them up there wow. all the time. So, you know, that's unbelievable, isn't it, really? Yeah. Such nice people. That's what I'm going to miss. And also, I miss, I'll miss the smoking, but I'll miss the people. You know, I might come down, give a hand here, because we've got a couple of really nice people um, have taken, taken the business over They've got really good ideas, similar to what... If I was 20 years younger, I'd be doing the same as they want to do now. But it's really good that they've come into the place, you know, and they're going to keep the smoke and traditional methods going, which is what I wanted. You know, I, I wanted to see the place. I could have sold it or let somebody else have it for a different something else different, but I wanted to keep it going. And they've come in. I mean, we got on fantastically well with them. Um, and I will help them as much as I can either physically working or on the phone if they want to know what something happens in the smoke and can't get the fires going with it, whatever, then I can tell them over the phone, well, you, you put too much water in the smoke, in the sawdust, so that's why it's killing the fires. So you just take the sawdust out, start again, and take the fires out, start again, and put a bit less on the back. You know, there's, there's not many things that can go wrong, really. But it's having the confidence. Like when I first started... I was, it was taking such a long time to smoke them, probably two or three hours more than it should, because I was sitting watching the fires, and I, oh God, I can't too much heat on there, I might ruin them, and, and you're over, overcompensating, overcompensating, and over a period of time, over the years, then you can realise what heat you can take. I mean, touch wood, I, I didn't, I've never ruined any in 25 years, you know, never ruined any, which is pretty good. Maybe the odd one was, I wasn't 100% happy with it, you know, but they were still okay, you know, seven out of ten. I tried to be getting eight and a half, nine out of ten. You never get a hundred. You never get ten out of ten ever in anything. I don't think.
no matter what you do, you're never, you're never going to get it 100%. But I, I always did it the best of my ability. Same in the shop, the, my wife worked here. She loved serving the people and talking to people, so she was like spot on. So she did mostly most of the serving in the shop. I did all the back work, but I, I went in the busy times, I'd help out. They'd cut the staff and they'd help out, do things, but mostly it was my wife or I in the shop all the time. That's what we tried to do. I'd give people good service, give them good quality. My dad always said to me, Dad, he said to me, son, don't expect somebody to eat something you wouldn't eat yourself. And I've got high standards of food, I, I like the food, and that's always been in my mind, right? If I wouldn't eat that, or I'm not happy to sell that as the best one, then you don't sell it as the best one, you sell it as a second. And that's all through my life, I've always done that. I've always give 100%, you know, and try the best I can, you know, and everything I've ever done, you know. And I think if you do that, and you don't make excess of it, well, you still tried, haven't you? And that's what Dan, Dan and Jennifer here now, they're going to give it 100% here. I know that. I know with, with the expertise I've got and the 100% um, the attitude they've got, I'm 100% sure they're going to make a, make a go of it.